I'm really excited about um, today's panel. We've got some really varied perspectives to bring to this discussion. Um, and we're gonna chat for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna have 15 minutes of Q&A because I always think that's the most interesting time is to hear your questions and comments about what we've been talking about. Um, and I wanna introduce um, Elizabeth Littlefield here on my right. Um, she was appointed by President Obama to lead the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, um, which is the US government's uh, development finance institution. Um, Elizabeth, like many of us, oversees a multi-billion dollar portfolio. <laughs> um, so you are really working with a lot of US companies and NGOs to invest in developing regions around the world to bring programs and resources to people who need it. Um, prior to that, you were with the World Bank's consultative group to assist the poor. And so I think you have a lot of expertise to bring about bridging that gap between resources and helping those we seek to serve. So I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Um, David Bombright, uh, you're somebody that I've heard so much about in my own work uh, covering the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. Um, anytime I talk to people about how should we assess projects, how do we know if we're having impact, have you talked to David Bonbright? Um, so I'm just so pleased to finally meet you and, and share the stage with you today because you are the founder and CEO of Keystone Accountability, um, you know, which is really working to kind of transform the fields of social investing and sustainable development. And one thing that I really appreciate about the work that you're doing is that you're really working to bring the voices of the people that we're trying to serve into how we assess the projects that we're working on. Um, oftentimes, in my opinion, we overlook the beneficiaries in the way that we assess projects, and I think you're really a strong proponent and voice for bringing their voices to the fore. Um, and prior to founding Keystone Accountability, uh, you worked with the Ford Foundation, with the Oak Foundation, and Ashoka, um, and so I'm just so pleased to have you here. Um, Mari Qureshi, uh, I've had the pleasure of being on a panel with you before, and um, so great to see you again. Mari is the co-founder of Global Giving, which an organization that she now leads, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Global Giving, but um, if you haven't visited the site, I'd really encourage you to do that. It's kind of an online, crowdsourced um, way to fund grassroots nonprofits around the world. Um, and I was thinking, you know, Mari, about really how important that is because um, I recently interviewed the former head of um, Charity Navigator, uh, Ken Berger, mm -hmm. and he said to me that he had done a bunch of research and found that if you look at all of the resources going to the US nonprofit sector, 86% of the resources in the nonprofit sector go to 1% of the nation's nonprofits, which mm -hmm. I found incredible and quite unfortunate, really. And I think what Global Giving is doing is bringing these philanthropic dollars to small grassroots organizations working on the ground in really important issues. So you were an innovator that way. You were an innovator about crowdsourcing way before it became so popular. And then prior to that, you were at the World Bank, um, where you were also an innovator, um, working with uh, your husband, Dennis Whittle, um, to develop the innovation marketplace, innovation and development marketplace, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with that initiative, but again, very groundbreaking because what you guys did is invited people around the world to bring their best ideas about how to tackle extreme poverty and invite them to share those ideas with the World Bank. And then had an event where the finalists were brought into the atrium of the World Bank to share their ideas about tackling poverty and really breaking down walls between the higher ups at the World Bank and innovative people on the ground. And so I'm really looking forward to talking to you about innovation and technology and how you've utilized it so well. And certainly, last but not least, Ed Martinez um, with the UPS Foundation. You are heading the UPS Foundation and um, in charge of a number of initiatives there with UPS's Global Philanthropic Initiatives. You are leading their diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, employee engagement, corporate relations, you're wearing many hats. Um, and I know that you also represent the UPS um, on the World Economic Forum's global agenda on humanitarian responses. And so the UPS Foundation has taken their logistics capabilities and brought it to bear on humanitarian crises around the world. So um, I think the UPS, UPS Foundation is showing a great way that we can combine the private sector expertise and technology 
with um, humanitarian crises and situations like that. And Ed, I know that you brought along just a short two-minute video that we're gonna start with. Um, and what I'd encourage everybody to look at with this two-minute video, it shows UPS working, the foundation using its technology to work in a um, refugee situation in Mauritania. And one thing I've noticed is I've reported a lot from Africa and saw a lot of technology that was not well suited to the environment, and I'm sure many of you have also experienced that. Look at the way that this technology is working in a very, in a situation where there's lots of sand, tents, heat, um, very basic uh, situation where technology is really assisting people. So let's just start with that and then we'll continue with the panel. Due to conflicts in Mali, more than 50,000 Malian people have sought refuge in Basi Kanu in Mauritania. Five different ethnic groups are now living together, depending on supplies from World Food Program, administrated by UNHCR. In order to create the most impact with the funds available, we are constantly trying to make food distribution and aid delivery as accurate and efficient as possible. Having UPS as a partner, we were able to tap into their expertise and knowledge of logistics. The distributions that we, we conduct hasn't changed much. We still have the same corridors that we used to have. We still have the same number of people that we used to have. But the UPS system has made it much easier for us and much more efficient. Clearly, with this system, surtout moi particulièrement, ce qui me rend confortable avec ce système, aujourd'hui, à quelques minutes près, une fois que la distribution est finie, on peut savoir exactement le nombre de bénéficiaires. For us to be able to properly identify an individual, we collect a biometric. Right now, it's only the fingerprint we're collecting, but we also do have other systems like the facial recognition that allows us to be much more accurate. UPS provided the software that collects and consolidates the data needed to accurately keep track of assistance delivery. Using the UPS relief link, all of this is done with handheld units. The UPS system, we actually load the data onto the, onto the gadget from the office, and the machine actually is playing the role of the laptop and the scanner at the same time. Before, we used to carry 25 laptops, because each distribution center needed five laptops and five backward scanners that were attached to the laptop. We also needed to have Excel sheets where we would either type in the data or scan it, if we were able to scan it. This was very, very labor intensive. We used to conduct the distributions for the entire day. By prototyping and testing the UPS relief link, we are taking a huge step in the right direction. Ed, you know, a lot of people in this room uh, may work in similar <coughs> situations, um, doing work around the world, and could probably benefit from the expertise an organization like yours brings, the technology that you bring. And I'm wondering, for those of us in the audience who are interested in trying to bring in the private sector to help us with our initiatives, what kind of things do you look for in a partner? You know, I th first of all, I want to thank Lindsay and Sam and, and the panelists really for the invitation uh, to participate here today and really for the interaction community uh, that really supports this, this conference. It's a, it's a great time to have these kind of conversations. You know, I think the entry point in, in having a, a good partner is to find out really what the focus areas are for a private sector organization. Uh, the private sector wants to do more, should do more, and, uh, but I think for an NGO, you really have to look at what they focus in on and what your needs are. And then that way you can have the beginnings of a, of a partnership. Uh, the other point is don't look for the traditional technology companies because many private sector companies maintain systems like call center support and back office operations that could lend you and give you capacity building for those technologies, and it's not always the traditional technology companies that you should look for. Many companies, as I said, have those capabilities and are willing to, to build your capacity. And, um are there particular qualities about the organizations that you've partnered with that you know um, lead to a successful relationship? Or conversely, have you learned some lessons along the way? It's like, wow, I, I, I realized that we shouldn't have done this, and here's why, and it's what I got from it. You know, we have an interesting uh, structure and architecture. We support 
global systemic programs with UNHCR and a number of other organizations that are represented here, but we also do grassroots capacity building at the ground level. So all in, we support about 4,000 organizations around the world every year, and that's because you know we operate in over 220 countries, and we believe that our employees must be engaged. So when something happens in Ecuador, it's impacting us because you know these are our communities too. So we encourage our employees to engage in small organizations around the world that align with our focus areas, and then we also maintain global systemic programs. But whether we're supporting organizations at the grassroots level or large systemic organizations, we really analyze the NGOs in much the same way that we analyze investing in a business. You look for governance. You look for who their supporters are. You look at how well they satisfy the community needs of the, of the community. So you, you really analyze these organizations in much the same way you invest in a company. Um, and that's a great segue to Elizabeth Littlefield because I know that you were working with a lot of private sector partners at OPIC. And, um, you know, from my perspective, covering the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors, I think that there does exist some tension um, that maybe many people here feel about the private sector's role in what has been traditionally nonprofit work. Um, and that I think a lot of people see opportunities for the private sector to assist in this regard. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I think there's a lot of feeling among people who have devoted their work to not the nonprofit sector for most of their career that the private sector doesn't actually appreciate the complexities of these situations. Yeah. Um, and can you talk to me a little bit about your experience with the private sector and how that, where do you see this, this discussion and this debate over the private sector's role in kind of humanitarian assistance and in working with developing nations? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, it's lovely to be here with all of you. I see many people in the room with whom we've worked closely, whether it be private businesses or NGOs. And frankly, it's only through your work that we're able to have the, the powerful development impact that we are having uh, in some of the lowest income countries in the conflict afflicted places in which we work. Um, but there is this tension traditionally, and I, I think it's abating now, because I think when people look at the math and you add up the, the cost of, of solving some of the global challenges. Look, if you take the price tag of the climate agreements and the sustainable development goals together, it comes to about $100 trillion with a T, and that the total aid budget globally is $135 billion with a B. So that's less than not even 1%. So clearly people know that that gap is going to have to be filled creatively someplace else, namely from private, you know, private capital. But it's not going to do it on its own. So that's where organizations like OPEC step in, because the private actors, in order to, do the, uh, to act in a way that solves these global problems, is going to have to get a little bit of support from the public sector. So that's basically our, our business model. And you know, we've seen over time, if you look at you know, just 20 years ago, the, the private sector wasn't investing in many of the things it's doing now today. Power generation is in, in Africa is almost exclusively uh, shifting to private sector education, health clinics. So they are playing a role. Aid will always have a huge role, and we have to make sure that private businesses are being held accountable to uphold you know, the highest standards of environment, social, and, and, and labor issues. But we see it. We, see it um, we work only with the private sector, but I don't actually distinguish between NGOs and the private sector. I, I draw the line between the public and the private, uh, and include in the client base that we work with both NGOs and, and private businesses. And um, are you seeing, um, in what ways are you seeing technology kind of transform the spaces that you're working in? Because I know um, when we talked earlier, you were talking about mobile banking, and we yeah. saw in Anne's represent, you know, her presentation there about, you know, the solar panels and people paying back, uh, yeah. you know, digitally and stuff like that. And um, how are you seeing recently, in months, recent months and years, uh, technology transforming this space? So we see trans uh, technology transforming our work in almost every imaginable sector. And not so much, um, not so much affect, well, it, it's, it's more that it's affecting our ability to reach the last mile and reach populations that we couldn't uh, have reached before. So, you know, for example, we all know in microfinance, and I spent many years in this sector, you know, mobile banking, I think we all know, you know, since I started working on M banking since 2004, uh, no one had any idea that this would have the transformative effect that it's having. And I was certainly one of those ones that thought, you know, the digital, digital divide 
you know, we don't have time for that. It's not for poor people. They need roads and bridges and food and water, not computers. Um, I was proven wrong myself back in 2004 when we started realizing the power of, of mobile banking to transform access to financial services. But also, um, as, as was said earlier by Anne, I think also, you know, in the power sector, we're seeing technology change the efficiency of power plants at the utility scale, whether it be geothermal or storage, or uh, solar for storage, but also all the, um, the, the off-grid microgrid systems, which have this pay-as-you-go, as was said at, at off-grid electric, which we were, we were very proud to see the iconic AID start something, and then it's taken over by a development finance institution and our, and our brethren, and then moves on to the private sector. That, we, we also were funders of, of um, off-grid electric. But there too, we see it's not about the technology, it's about the business model and the payment systems that actually drives those, those off-grid um, energy systems and the culture too, but we can come back to that. Um, it, even in the education sector, which was traditionally, of course, the domain for the public sector, we're seeing some really interesting you know, young uh, organizations that are using highly structured curriculum delivered remotely on iPads to get over the, the, the difficulty of doing teacher training in remote areas. And they're able to provide this very effective primary education for $6 a month mm. with test scores that are very, very strong. So even in the education sector, we're seeing, we're seeing. And then the last area I would mention where um, there's been a real priority, there was just a big event this weekend on connectivity, because people think, again, digital divide, internet's not really relevant to poverty alleviation, but we've all heard the, the numbers that every 10% increase in access to the internet uh, increases GDP by one to two percent. So it's a real booster for development. Uh, and in that area, you know, OPIC, for example, is working with a number of different broadband providers and inter internet providers to provide basic uh, wireless broadband access in remote areas of India, which can have a powerful driver for development outcomes. So those are just a few of the areas that we're seeing technology affect our work, mobile banking, energy, education, and connectivity. Mari Qureshi, um, as I said in the intro, I mean, you are, have been such an innovator, and you know, I think a lot of people in this room um, would love to be more innovative um, and look for opportunities and, and to you know, move where, there, where opportunities arise. But I also imagine in you know, your trajectory, you've also encountered things that you thought would work that didn't. Um, and I'm just wondering, if you could talk about an example of a time where you were trying to innovate, um, saw an opportunity, and maybe it didn't quite work out, and, and what you learned from that experience. Thank you, Amy, and uh, also thank you to Lindsay and Sam for the opportunity to, to talk before all of you. Um, let me tell you a story about a, a project that failed on global giving. This is actually almost 10 years ago, so back when we were much smaller, we had, um, we had projects in Kenya, in Kibera, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. And we, we faced a sort of M&E challenge. We didn't know what was going on, and so we sent a staff member to Kibera. He, he had this idea, he had this crazy idea of going around with the equivalent of 1-800, how's my driving? You know, mm -hmm. Your UPS trucks have that. Uh, have that uh, sticker on the back. Um, and it was literally that sticker. That's, that's what we had in our heads. Not, not terribly technologically uh, advanced, but that was what we went with. And he came across this NGO that was doing sports for youth. This will be familiar to many of you. Uh, kids in Kibera don't have anything to do, and they get into trouble. So a lot of NGOs focus on sports, and it's empowering and all that. He, he started talking to the youth who said, well, you know, the, the soccer program's okay, but we, we don't really know why we're here. And he said, huh, okay. So he went back to the NGO and started sort of asking questions, looking, you know, doing a, a very light social audit. And said, well, you know, it, it seems to be fine, like many other youth empowerment programs. Um, but it could do with a little bit more tightening up around its financial controls and things like that. And as, as we do with, um, with every project, these reports, the staff write-ups, go to the donors of that project. So it duly went out over the internet to the donors of that project. 
And among the donors to that project was a professor at Oregon State University who said, huh, okay, well, I've got some grad students. They, they need a summer project, so I'm gonna send us, how, how about I send some grad students over there? So grad students were very excited. This was field work. They, they showed up in Kibera. And um, they worked with the leader to do a little bit of development, <coughs> then said, you know, Stall the kids, hey, look, why don't we do a field trip? Why don't we go see some other youth projects that do soccer? So they went around, as, as you might imagine. There are actually a fair number of such projects. And then we didn't hear anything for a while. That, that the grad students sent out something to the donors, and we felt really great because we have finally sort of connected the donors with the project and the youth, and this is exactly what we had to sort of hope technology would happen. Six months later, the project leader writes to us in a panic saying, all the kids have left. And we're like, really? Where'd they go? <laughs> we wouldn't know. Um, he said, they, they went to this other NGO. You have to do something. I'm like, what do you mean we have to do something? So what had happened was that the youth had gone and seen a, a you know, youth soccer project that they like better. And they walked. They, they voted with their feet. And so we, we shut down that project and sent out a note to the donors explaining why. And, you know, I tell this story because this is one of these instances that sort of generated this aha moment. Like, wow, what if we could really reach the people whom we seek to serve and give them the choice of what they want, what they need, when they need it, from whom they need it, and not be in the business of sort of coming in and saying, well, you should really have you know, training for your agricultural extension workers. Like, that's what you really need, because that's what we figured out is the most important thing. And it was a, it was a real moment in um, sort of the, the power of serendipity and accidents to show you what is possible. And it was really 10 years ago that we started saying, we're not there yet to really reach the people we seek to hurt, serve. But everything we do from here on out should be sort of aligned against that North Star. And we should be figuring out all our systems so that we might one day be in a position to drive the, the process from that end instead of from, from our end. So it, 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 it's not technology per se, although I have been obviously very, I, I, global giving owes a lot to technology. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for social media, if it weren't for improved financial flows, all of these things. But that behavioral shift was, was visible even without technology. And um, it's, it's given us uh, a very clear aligned road against which we can sort of conduct all our experimentation. Because the other way to do experimentation is just do everything. You know, the equivalent of throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing which strand sticks. But that gets frustrating after a while, as, as probably many of you can, we, we did a lot of that ourselves. We kept throwing stuff against the wall. It's very frustrating because the success rate is low. It's very helpful when you can kind of figure out what is the sort of bright line against which we sort of innovate. Thank you for that, Mari. And you know, I appreciate the fact that you're willing to talk about a project that didn't work, um, because I think that we don't do enough of that in the nonprofit sector. And um, I think when we share what we've learned, uh, we can all improve. So thank you for that. And I think um, David Bombright, that's a nice segue to you, because you know what I appreciate is that Mari was listening to the voices of those she was trying to help. And I know, as I said earlier, that at Keystone Accountability, you're a big proponent of that. Um, and, you know, since we're talking about technology, um, I, I see another tension in the sector, which is this, that uh, we have so much capability these days to harness technology, to use big data, to try to understand complex issues. And I think that there's obviously absolutely a role for that. But at the same time, you know, 
I've been a reporter traveling around Africa for many years, and I see the value of looking people in the eye, face to face, insights that we're trying to work in, and, and, and asking people directly, human contact, about how is this project going in your life? Um, how can it be improved? And I'm wondering if you can talk about your experience between that tension, between you know, the ability of us to kind of assess projects from afar versus the need to really get on the ground, visit sites, look people in the eye and see how projects are going. Where do you see that tension? Well, thank you, Amy. And I'm gonna build somewhat shamelessly on, on Mari's example. Um, my takeaway from what Mari said is that the technology is great, the connectivity is great, we can actually bring people from different corners of the world to be working together on the problem. Uh, but if you don't actually empower people at the base, you don't get the result. And in, in fact, what it is, it's technology plus design. It's technology plus intention. That's when you get the big impact. So our work is all about helping organizations have better feedback loops, particularly with the people they serve, but also with their other constituents. And Data and technology is an important part of that. We use microsurveys uh, and organizations, uh, for example, one of, our, one of our clients is a workforce development organization, very, very strong, kind of a poster child for evidence-based uh, work. And, uh, and they have weekly meetings where their staff review evidence, and we came along and added surveys of their program participants. They transition people from long-term unemployment into permanent jobs. And they began to all of a sudden, right away, learn interesting things from the surveys. They learned, we, we need to change the time when this course is offered because it's inconvenient for people. Now, that had always been uh, known. They'd kind of known it all along that it was inconvenient. But the staff could resist it until it was there in the data, survey after survey, week after week. And all of a sudden, OK, we got to change the time. It's inconvenient for us, but it's better for them. So the data was playing a useful role there. But it wasn't getting the deeper kind of engagement that they were looking for. And the scores were extremely high, consistently high. They couldn't get much critical feedback. They knew they weren't that good. So we began to do the face-to-face -face piece. We went back and began an inquiry focus groups, informal conversations. Come on, guys, we're not that good. What's the deal here? And in the course of that, what we learned was that we were asking the wrong question. Not the questions in the surveys but the question behind the question. So the question we were asking was, how are we doing? How can we serve you better? The question we should have been asking is, how are you? And as soon as we shifted to ask the how are you, the floodgates opened, huge variation in the data, and the burden of improvement then was shifted back to the organization. It was their job, but, what, but the energy got stronger, the relationships between staff and the participants got more intense. So it's really a process of engagement, and it comes out of that that process about closing the loop with people and showing them you're really engaged. So just to conclude, my kind of takeaway from all this vis-a-vis -vis technology is that if you really want to have developmental impact, the technology is neutral. It increases your reach, your speed, your connectivity, maybe your efficiency. But, but if you really want to have development impact, if you want to empower people from within, that's an exercise of design. And I'm interested, you know, when you work with organizations and nonprofits and helping them to assess their work and bringing in the voices of the beneficiaries and getting data from them, um, you know, one thing that I'm kind of interested in is what that means for the organization. And can you talk about if we are going to encourage nonprofits to gather more data from their beneficiaries, if that data that comes back says, you know what? you're not doing a great job. You know, mm. when you start getting those more truthful answers from beneficiaries, mm. what does that mean for the organization? And how do you work with organizations to prepare them to receive what could be negative data, negative feedback? Well, that's a, that's a really important and big question, and I'm afraid the time we have isn't going to allow all of it. I'll give you the headlines. <laughs> One, you, do, you work internally with people to get ready to receive the feedback. And I mean, we are all hot-wired to resist negative feedback. So you actually, we, we start with, we have a little workshop on brain science, and we take people through, through sims, and, the, and we had come out the other side, and people start to get ready for it. Two, you've got to bring the donors in. People are worried about getting punished from their donors if the negative feedback comes out. So we get everybody together. We say, guys, it's not the scores that matter. It's the trends over time. Let's look for improvement. Those kinds of things. It's, we're into the realm of craft now. This is a craft. You can, you can solve these problems. Hmm. Um, 
I want to talk to both Ed Martinez and, and Elizabeth. Um, you know, I also think there's a tension around data in terms of uh, on, when nonprofits are pushed, as they increasingly are, to share their data. Um, I think that can often be, um, it's first of all a big ask for organizations with limited resources to produce reliable data about their work. But furthermore, it can be scary to kind of put it out there. And I know even interaction itself is involved with your open data map and, um, you know, I think a lot of times there's pushback from nonprofits, but I think in the private sector, data is kind of more prized, and I was talking to a guy even last night. I don't want to see these pictures up here of the work. I want to see the data behind it. And can you talk about the ways in which sharing data, um, and I, I imagine you look at data of organizations you're going to invest in, how can that, that can be a beneficial thing to share uh, with donors, with investors, and with the public as we try to tackle these really difficult issues. Elizabeth, do you want to start? Um, sure, I, I'd be happy to start. I mean, uh, for a small-ish development agency, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, transparency is very, very expensive. Um, but we, we're very proud of the fact that we, we're now far more open and transparent than we were about the data um, emanating from <coughs> our projects, both at selection but also monitoring. And after, although there's much more that needs to be done, I would love to have the resources to do an evaluation of development impact after a loan is repaid or after a private equity sale has happened, but we don't have that right now, but it would be, as a development professional, that would be, for me, the holy grail, but it's not something we're capable of doing right now. We are now posting on foreignassistance.gov uh, all, of, all of our projects, uh, so that's, I think, a big step in the right direction. But for me, the data, as you mentioned, actually, and I was just coming back on Mari's story about lessons learned, for me, the, the, and, and what you were saying as well about asking uh, how this project has affected you, know, you as, a, as, a, as a participant. And I was thinking back in the very early days of, uh, again, mobile banking, again, 2004, when, remember, in the beginning, it was really airtime. There were minutes that were being bought mm -hmm. and one airtime reseller and then transferred to somebody else's phone where they would then go to their airtime reseller in the rural area, hand in those minutes and get cash. So it was a way of moving cash around the country. But what we, what we found in the early days was really an amazing unintended consequence for me, and, and a sad one, and that was, in many cases, the flows were husbands, men working in the urban areas, sending money to their wives in the rural areas. And it was super convenient because he used to have to take the money, the cash and paper bags on public transportation um, and go miles and miles or sometimes days to take the cash and give it to his family and then go on the on the bus and go back in a few days' time. So it was great from one perspective because as the, as the families were getting money little bits at a time in these rural areas through airtime, they were able to buy thing, essential goods throughout the month rather than buying it all at once after payday when all the prices in those areas go up. So her money, her money went farther. But what we also found was that men weren't going home very often. And so there was a whole breakdown mm -hmm. And it was much more efficient, of course, but there was an entire, in many cases, a really damaging breakdown in family fabric and communities and, and marriages because they, the face-to-face -face interaction that you were just talking about was actually discouraged by this new technology. So that was a, a big wake-up call that we only got because we went and looked on the ground and talked to the people and got the data about impact and, and discovered something that no no annual report would have ever told us. Absolutely, it says a lot about the organizations involved that they could even discern that that was happening. Yeah. Because there's so many uh, programs like that that would, they would never even know the social ramifications <clears throat> right. of a, a seemingly good project. Though um, I have to say, if you were conducting regular surveys of the women, you would have known. Why? They would have told you. The men aren't coming home anymore. It's great to have the money, but I miss my husband. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Super easy. Yeah. Yeah, and yet a lot of, I mean, I, and, and that gets into a whole other conversation about how we interview, you know, beneficiaries, and I think a lot of times those things aren't said, you know, and I think there's a lot of problems with the way that mm -hmm. we interview and speak with uh, those we're, we're trying to help and that we don't, some, you know, sometimes that information isn't immediately forthcoming and doesn't get, yeah. you know, relayed in the data, and it takes a little more digging and time to actually garner that from the people we're trying to help. Definitely. I, I wanted to offer up one more example of that, just for the project design, phase, and again, coming back to technology-driven generation of off-grid um, electric power in rural areas, 
it's very interesting to see culture by culture how strong the preferences are for one business model over another. So again, it's, it's not about the technology. Yes, it's about the business model, but sometimes it's really about what that culture is accustomed to. So for example, in some cases, we're finding that people don't really want to own the sol solar panel on their roof. They just want someone else to put it there, take care of it, own it, and they want to pay like they pay a utility. In other cases, people actually want to own it, take care of it, and p borrow money, and then pay it back, and then the electricity they get is free. But people are, people's preferences for one model over the other, we find just in the, within the same country can be very strong, whether they want ownership or fee services. Okay. And Ed Martinez. You know, from a uh, transparency perspective, sharing data, it, it's really about being able to tell the story. UPS, we have over 435,000 employees. And if I can tell the story of what's happening in Mauritania, then you have not only sort of the UPS Foundation, but you have all of these people rallying around an organization or a cause. So uh, we work very closely with our organizations to get that story, to get that information. And of course, showing impact, of co that's the holy grail, right? If I can demonstrate to my board of trustees that for every dollar that I invest, in the community, X amount happens. I mean, that, that's, that's a perfect world. But we understand that the NGO community, nonprofit partners, it's expensive sometimes to be able to show that science. We, we work very closely uh, with the CDC on measuring our road safety uh, programs. And we understand that uh, it, it sometimes takes an exorbitant amount of funding to get to that impact analysis. So it is a tension, but I think most importantly, to be able to tell that story to the global community goes a long way in order to make you a stronger organization in order for you to attract additional sponsors, additional supporters. Mari Kureshi, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, and I just wanna talk to you a little bit about um, crowdsourcing as a technology. I think it's something that a lot of nonprofit sector is really interested in these days, is kind of harnessing small donations to support their cause. And I'm just wondering, what have, are a couple big takeaways that you've learned in the last few years, kind of spearheading you know, the biggest you know, crowdsourcing platform in this space, um, that some people here might be able to use um, and learn from? I think, you know, one, one central insight, you know, back when 2001, when we got the idea for Global Giving, we were convinced that if you build it, they will come. And um, that turned out to be wrong, of course. People don't wake up in the morning thinking, how can I give to the, you know, the refugees in Mauritania and make their lives better? They wake up thinking, I wonder when the new iPhone's going to come out and you know, whether I can go and get one for Christmas or just as a treat for myself. Crowdfunding in our space requires a reason, uh, a reason that kind of jolts people away from their usual day-to-day -day lives. Some of that can be you know, external events, like a disaster. We've got you know, a, a disaster in Ecuador right now with the earthquake, I'm sure, you know, some of you are already mobilizing for it. That brings the, you know, the images, the news stories, right up to people's doors through television, through social media, through newspapers. That can be a motivator. Um, you know, back to school, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. These are events that sort of bring things up into people's lives. And it is up to us to sort of capitalize on, um, on these events to see if we can get people, again, just shift them subtly from what they might otherwise be doing. Because when you're crowdfunding on the web, you know, a, a, a cute cat story is, is your competition. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, you've got to be pretty good to compete against a kitten. And um, so compelling stories, to your point, Ed, compelling events and marrying them together. And it could be, the event can be very, you know, sort of one-to-one. -one. It can be somebody's birthday 
and someone asking, instead of a birthday present, can you donate to something else? You've got to create the, the conditions, essentially, for proximity, and proximity to that person's emotional space. And that, I think, is the, the, the most important meta message that I can give you around crowdfunding because it's got to be meaningful, it's got to be memorable, and it's got to be easy to do. I think that's a great way to end the, this part of the panel discussion, and I think you know, it'd be great to open it up to you guys for about 15 minutes or so. Um, and it'd be wonderful if you have any questions, if you could stand, first of all. We have a mic that's probably gonna be going around. There it is over there. And also, it'd be great to hear your name and where you're from before you start your questions. So does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists? Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Deborah Robinson. I'm academic director at the SIT Graduate Institute DC Center. Um, we're, we're trying, we're educating the next generation leaders in sustainable development for 2020, 2025, 2030. And when I think about how I, I NGOs can thrive and, and survive, I think about the human resources that are needed. So maybe I could extrapolate from what you've said already but in, in NGOs, in business, in government, what's missing? What, where are the gaps in, as people come to your organizations, your agencies, in terms of skills, knowledge, abilities, experience, um, to work in, in your agency or organization? And you're interested specifically, did you say in design? Uh, no, we're, we're an educational institution. Okay. So we are, it's a master's program. So I'm interested in what we need to do to prepare our students to be able to effectively work in organizations and government agencies and businesses so that they can strive, survive and thrive. And another way I love putting that is like, what problem do you want to solve? And I think that might be a nice way for you all to answer the question. Do you see a problem out there that needs to be solved? I mean, I know there's many, but could you articulate one? Because I think that's a nice way of getting at that. Where, where where are the problem areas that you need some innovation for the next generation coming up? And let's just go down the road. Let's start with Elizabeth, if you've got. Well, it's a huge question, and I guess if I had to pick one thing, I would, I would pick the word empathy, uh, because I find that many people uh, see the world from their perspective, and to be really effective at serving clients, at serving NGOs, and at serving end beneficiaries, you have to be able to have the maturity and the wisdom and the empathy to put yourselves in the shoes of those people and see the world as they see them. That's awesome, I love that. You David. stole my uh, point. So sorry. <laughs> Beautiful, I, I just wanna echo that and say absolutely and, and from a staff point of view, people who have the ability to empathize and translate that into the workplace are you know, gold, pure gold. I think that uh, someone coming into the organization that's had community engagement experience gives them a tremendous depth of that empathy and, and how it is to be able to relate to, uh, to a global economy. Mari. I'm gonna twist the emotions maybe far beyond the, <laughs> what Elizabeth and, and David might say. I find that people who come into our sector are already passionate and you know, imbued with a sense of, I, I want to do something for the world, you know, I, I want to dedicate myself to something. And I find that that comes with a, a certain conviction about, I want to do good and I know what good is. So I would like to urge you know, the educators in this room to teach their students to hold their beliefs lightly and to be open to hearing and receiving you know, data, knowledge, feedback, whatever, that can change their minds uh, and not get too tied up in their conception of what it means to be good. Humility, yeah, I mean, I think uh, humility is often yeah. very important in this space. Yeah. Um, do we, and we have another question back there, yes. Hi, thank you for the enlightening, wonderful presentation. My name is Meredith, I'm with Relief International, and I have a question about outcomes. We also are having um, kind of a reassessment of how we measure our outcomes, and I'm thinking specifically of the funding cycle. 
So looking at, for example, USAID or the European Commission, the funding on the project ends, and you can produce a monitoring and evaluation report after the funding cycle ends, up to three to six months after the project has ended, with EC funding. So if we want to get at output, say for example using health projects, if we want to determine the reduced um, malnutrition rates in pregnant and lactating females, mothers for example, and that is data that we would gather, I would assume, multi years after the project has ended. What are your suggestions for the best approach at getting accurate data output indicators which aren't filled with noise from other potential contributions to those um, hopefully increased indicators. And just before, I think David, you'll be very well placed to, but I just want to follow up on your question. And, and are, you talk, are you also expressing some frustration about the fact that you're only getting data when the project is over, um, that you would like to be able to get it in not necessarily real time, but more frequently as the process is going along? Um, a little bit of both, but I think I like, um, I think what Anne May said earlier and this forum has said, I completely agree with the learning model is underused and adaptability in programs is something that um, could be more integrated, but this question specifically is end of project results and how do we successfully measure and capture the outcomes, the long-term indicators. What is the reduced transmission of communicable diseases for X village in mm -hmm. Ethiopia? For example, five years after the project has mm -hmm. ended, and how do we fund that kind of M&E study? David Bombright. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on a little bit of a limb here, but this is one of my big bets, so let me put it out there. So Ed referred to impact measurement is the holy grail, it's super expensive, really tough to do. First time I ever heard Mari Qureshi in a public forum, it was a, a Davos meeting, uh, and a bunch of people sitting there talking about impact measurements, and Mari kind of put her hand up and in her quiet way said, you know, the World Bank, you get 100 super smart people in a room, and they spend a week, and at the end of the week, they're no closer to seeing the same thing about measurement than they were at the beginning. So this is a huge and open problem, and we're not going to solve it here, or I don't think. So the, we're trying to take a completely other tack at it, which is to say, what if we were able to find real-time measures, and we're not going to have you know, gold standard, randomized controlled trial, uh, validation of causation, but what if we were able to track over time things that were, we could see and measure today that consistently correlated to those outcomes that you measure down the road. So in other words, those leading predictive indicators really work at getting those. And that's gonna take a long time because you have to measure the long-term outcomes and look at the correlations. But then once you've got it, then you've got a measure that you can believe in in real time that's easy and inexpensive. And I'll give you an example from the Gates Foundation's work in education in the US. They were looking for measures of teacher effectiveness and they spent several million dollars working with the Harvard Department of Education to try to understand what's the best way to measure teacher effectiveness. And they had an objective measure that they could look at, which is scores on the tests at the end of the year, the learning outcomes. So they had that. But they wanted to know before the tests. They wanted to know nine months earlier, at the beginning of the school year, so that you had a, a tool. Well, they tried observational uh, studies and had master teachers in the back of the classroom, and they tried lots of different things. But Guess what turned out to be the best measure of teacher effectiveness? Student feedback. But you have to ask the right question. You don't ask, do you like your teacher? The question that it turned out to be the one was, do you and your classmates treat this teacher with respect? Okay, now, without several million dollars in the work, we never would have figured that out. But now we have a real-time measure, easy to collect, that correlates to outcomes. That's the direction I think we should be going. Fabulous. Um, yes, here in the front. My name is Nepola Jipo, and I'm from Liberia, West Africa. I have a question, and <clears throat> my question is, do we have 
like a long-term plan um, for our beneficiary so that when we pull out of the country, that they will continue to sustain themselves as to that project that we had introduced to them. Like for an example, I, I was born and raised in this country, and I know that USA has um, formed a lot of money in that country for agriculture. But at the end of every season, if you go into the interior part of that country, people die of hunger. Is there any other way that we could make a strategy so that our project there will have a different phase as a positive result? I used to work for the Lutheran World Federation of World Services that was sponsored by USEF as a field agent. And our work there was to distribute tools to farmers and sea rice. But the only difference that I saw that it made was that these poor farmers were used to going to the blacksmith culturally and making themselves tools to do their farm. The difference was that the only thing is one farmer would have two to three, four pieces of different tools. But at the end of the term, people still die from hunger into the interior part of that country. And I am a witness to it too. So my question is, there could, could there be any other strategy instead of giving tools to farmer every year and then they, they will only have extra tools, but then they still die all of hunger, could there be any other strategy to introduce instead of giving tools? So that at least when the turn is over, they will be able to sustain themselves, they will continue to sustain themselves. Thank you for that, and it's obviously, you know, the million dollar question I think so many people in the nonprofit space are facing, which is sustainability and making projects that last long after the funding dollars have dried up. And um, Murray, I mean, you're involved with so many, I mean, literally thousands of projects, and, and what are you learning about sustainability and how to avoid the very problems that this woman just raised? Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I may give a disappointingly meta answer to, to your question, I recognize that. But when you know, my co-founder and I left the World Bank, we were deeply engaged with this problem of sort of flying in, designing something. Granted, the, the funding was fairly large and over many years, but then you know, one day it ends. And, and either the intervention you made is sustainable or it's not, and frequently it's not. Roads are built and they're not maintained, or pumps are put in and they're not maintained. So we, we sort of swung the other direction entirely and said, let's just do the things that the people in the community who are not flying out of that community at the end of the project want and have designed for themselves as, as much as possible and fund that. Now, even then, we can end up with interventions that sort of dry up when the funding, when the subsidy funding disappears. And I don't think we've necessarily cracked the nut, but at least we've sort of left that, that decision and the design to the local community who, who is encouraged to come back to us and say, okay, we tried this, and we discovered that we're not terribly good at maintaining whatever system that we decided to put in place. We figured out something else. And it's, it's that promise of an iterated learning process where you might come start out with something that sounds like a good idea at the time, but turns out over time it's not. And the, the only thing I can suggest is that if we are there for the long term, and this is certainly our aspiration as, as a funding platform, then we can be with the community in their learning journey to something that is ultimately sustainable and not going to dry up when the subsidy goes away. Amy, can I come in for 30 Please, seconds? Elizabeth, yes. I, I would just completely agree with what you said. And um, have, I'm planning to do a post-Ebola investor trip to Liberia. You'll be happy to know. So if anyone would like to join me to bring private investment in to solve these problems, I'd be delighted to have you. But more, more immediately, though, I think the critical thing is to, is to figure out a way to better connect and sequence different types of support. Too often, grant funding is made and then it's over, and then you know, both of you made this remark. 
without a vision to connect it <coughs> to other sources of capital that may be longer term, maybe have a higher bar in terms of sustainability, but can be can can propel a, a project into financial sustainability. So we see in, in some of the most difficult places in which OPEC works, post-conflict places, very low income places, it's often we're coming on the heels of an AID program or an MCC program or a foundation program who's been the venture investor, if you will, but then hands it over to us once the business model has been proven, and then we can provide you know 20 year financing in very large sums to make sure it's scaled up. But to, to me, it's, it's connecting the grant funded activity to something that the private sector can then adopt, expand, scale up. Um, we've got like a minute left, so if somebody's got a quick question and then we'll give a quick answer, and there's the microphone in the back. Hi, my name is Anna O'Mani from Concern Worldwide. I suppose I'm interested in the, in the title of the session here, how INGOs can survive and thrive. <laughs> Why should NGOs survive and thrive? We're, we're in the business of poverty el elimination. And, and therefore, should our objective and our long-term vision be our own survival and, and how we thrive, or should we be looking at trying to do ourselves out of business? Thank you. I think that's a fabulous way to just end this panel, with, is, <laughs> really, is with yeah. that question. And I think we can all walk away and ruminate on that, and I think it's a point well taken. Thank you all so much. Thank you.